Remember watching old movies when the station master walks out onto the train platform, pulls out his gold pocket watch, and practically counts down the train's arrival? Three, two, one, and bam, there's the train. Rail used to be by far the most reliable form of transport. After that, things slipped a little. A few years ago, I could hop on a train first thing in the morning for a four-hour ride to Seattle and be pretty sure I would get there sometime that day. Maybe. But rail is making a comeback in safety and reliability these days, and it's largely because of people like you and me. Rail is catching up on technology, like many other critical application areas, and that's having a major positive impact. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. When you're working on high reliability systems for rail or any other industrial or transportation application, your choice of interconnect is critical. My guest today is Egbert Stalingna from TE Connectivity, and we're going to look at the latest interconnect solutions for building reliable data networks on trains. Let's go. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about TE Connectivity's Rail Data Connectivity Portfolio. Hi, Egbert. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Okay, so we're here to talk about rail systems, but how does what we're going to talk about today fit into the overall mission at TE Connectivity? Well, our mission is to uh, create a safer, sustainable, productive, and connected future. If you look to rail systems, sustainable they are for sure, because most of them use uh, electrical energy. And our data connectivity systems, the products that we're going to be talking about today, are contributing to a productive and connected future of the rail systems. Okay, now Egbert, TE connectivity has been in the rail industry market for some time, but what about the data connectivity aspect here? You're a relatively new player in this part of the arena, right? Yeah, our history goes way back to uh, the 50s, I believe, uh, in the rail industry or even before that. But about three, four years ago, we recognized that there is a trend ongoing in the rail uh, industry about the rail industry is starting to embrace the Internet of Things, cloud computing and big data analytics. And the key trends there are the drive for automation. So driverless trains, basically, the same that we're seeing starting to happen in automotive right now is already happening in trains over short stretches in airports and in metros, for instance. But we also see it going to happen over longer stretches. And that needs a very, very reliable and stable data stream to happen. The second one is predictive maintenance. We are coming from a system where train operators are applying Preventative maintenance, where the train comes in the garage every night and it's maintained through action lists, maintenance lists and checklists for everything that uh, needs to uh, be checked. And with the integration of sensors in the trains, we can now predict when devices are going to fail within a certain period of time. Now think about a wheel bearing with a vibration sensor, you can predict when the wheel bearing is going to wear out. And then the last one is connected mobility, where the passengers nowadays want to be connected to the Wi-Fi network. They want to know how long it takes until they arrive in the next station, what the next station is, etc. So all these systems or all these trends, they lead to increased amount of data connectivity in the trains. As a result of that, we see the data connectivity growing at a pace of 10% which is approximately four times faster than the overall rail market. With the rail data connectivity portfolio that we have established, our key driver is to reduce the operating cost and improve the travel experience for our passengers. That makes total sense. Now, specifically, what does TE Connectivity offer in this space? We offer a ruggedized rail-approved network product portfolio which enables our customer to reduce their operating cost and provide the best travel experience for the passengers. And that portfolio consists of a series of M12 connectivity. And the M12 connector is basically the same connector as the RJ45, which is used in building networks, but then in a far more ruggedized variant. 
we offer cable assemblies made up of these M12 connectors. We offer antennas to enable the wireless connectivity with the station or the garage. And then we offer Ethernet switches and gateways. And in the end, this allows us to provide the physical onboard network installed in a train. That makes sense. Now, Egbert, let's step back a little bit and talk about what exactly a rail communication architecture looks like. What all does it include? If you look to the picture that's shown here, you see on the rooftop there's an antenna. That's where it all starts, right? The antenna picks up the signal from the air, from the station, or from the garage, or from the network. Then it brings it into the train. It goes then into a radio, and that radio turns the RF signal into an Ethernet signal, which is then distributed in the train network. But as many of us are aware, you can't just split an Ethernet signal like you do with a power signal. You have to have devices in between, like a postman, uh, which delivers the, the packages of information to the right receiver. And those devices are called switches. You find those also in the network. And those switches, they need to be connected to each other, right? So in order to do that, you use cables, but also connectors at the end of each cable to make sure that you can uh, disconnect and connect the cables when needed. And then in the branches of the network, you will find the devices. Those devices can be the sensors that we just talked about, but also the Wi-Fi antenna, the CCTV camera system, which is on board, the driver telephone system, the passenger announcement system, the passenger information systems, even the clock nowadays is connected to the internet system because it gets its time from the GPS signal from the antenna. And there's many more applications or devices connected to the network, as I already told. For the products that are in our portfolio, we divided them into three groups. First group being the devices, which is actually the Ethernet switches and the gateways. The second group is connectors and cable assemblies, basically the connectivity. And then the third group is the antennas. Okay, great. Now let's dig into that RDC portfolio a bit. Egbert, what does it really buy me as an engineer? Well, first of all, RDC stands for Real Data Communication Products. I call them Real Data Communication Products because the focus application is real, but there's also adjacent applications. You can think about applications like um, bus, so public transportation. And also in bus, there's tram and metro as well. Don't think about train only. And you can also think about other applications like heavy duty trucks. You can think about agricultural vehicles, mining equipment. Basically, the product portfolio that we are going to see now is suitable for all applications where you see lots of shocks and vibrations. So when I talk about rail, don't only think about rail, but think about ruggedized. Our first product is the um, M12 connector, and we have an ultra ruggedized M12 connector in our portfolio. And this product really stands out from the fact that it is absorbing lots of shock and vibration. And that is done with a couple of features. First of it being the machined crim contact, so this product has uh, machined contacts, not uh, stamped and formed contacts, but machined contacts. It has a strain relief, which is a crimped strain relief. And this strain relief is very different from what we see in, in other connectors. And I will explain a little bit later what it actually uh, means. But this provides a very, very ruggedized connector. It's basically the strain relief that makes the difference between uh, our M12 connector or this M12 connector portfolio and the portfolio of competition. Further to this, the connectors that we're seeing right now are, of course, IP67. They are EN45545 compliant. That is a specification or a standard which is used in real to make sure that um, people are not getting killed if a fire breaks out in the trains. They are fully metal, so they are made of a solid machined brass housing. 
And we have them available in several codings, in uh, decoded and in A-coded with eight pins and with four pins and with five pins. And they're pretty small compared to uh, the products that we see with competition. And we also have an X-coded version of this. X-coded is uh, pretty new. The advantage of X-coded is that it can do uh, 10 gigabit per second. What I didn't tell you with the previous slide is that it comes in a right angle version and that applies to the X-coded as well. And we are one of the first in the market with an X-coded right angle product. And the reason why we can make this X-coded right angle product is we do this jacket crimping. For the rest, this X-coded product is pretty much the same as the A and the decoded product. It comes with the same machined crim contacts with the EN4505 compliant plastic materials with IP67 water ingress rating and the vibration features here. Okay, so Egbert, you mentioned crimped strain relief. Now, I'm not exactly sure what this is. So tell me, what do you see as the advantages here? Crimped strain relief basically refers to the way that we do the strain relief in the connector. Every connector needs to have a strain relief. And typically in these kind of connectors, you see a rubber strain relief. You know, you've probably seen this uh, system in many other connectors where you feed a cable through a piece of rubber and that rubber is then compressed between two surfaces and provides a strain relief. The disadvantage of this system is that you can unwantedly release the strain relief and also there's still a possibility to turn around, to rotate the cable in the strain relief. We solve that problem with this crimped strain relief. Basically what we're doing is we are hard crimping the cable jacket and the braiding of the cable on a piece of metal or with a piece of metal. And we do that with a hexagon crimp. After we make this crimping, we can ensure that uh, we have the best EMI and RFI performance because we terminate the shield in a 360 degree circular area with this crimping mechanism. We Ensure that the cable is still IP67 sealed by an O-ring. And normally that would have been done with this rubber insert, but we do it with the O-ring. By doing this crimping, we eliminate cable rotation because the cable jacket and the braiding is really, really fixed on a part which goes underneath the, the cable jacket and the cable braiding. And after the crimping is done, the connector cannot be tampered with anymore. So it's vandalism free. And then the way we constructed this connector and the way we designed this connector is such that we have a very minimum amount of components and that allows for a very, very fast field assembly time, which saves about 25% field assembly time. Wow, that's great. Now, Egbert, this crimp strain relief has to be adjusted to the cable. Is that right? That's correct. The big drawback of this connector is that it has to be adjusted for each cable, but we already have released a lot of cables with this connector. We have a big database of cables that we know, and as such, uh, most of the cables used in rail are already foreseen and known by us, and we already have set up part numbers for that. If there is a connector or a cable which is not yet tested by us, then we ask our customer to stand a one meter cable, we can do quickly some testing, then we can set up the part numbers needed for this new cable. And Egbert, do you have any more general solutions as well here? Yeah, so in case the engineer using this still prefers the solution with a PG clamp, as we call it, the rubber grommet, then we also have a connector with this PG clamp, which can accommodate for a large range of cable diameters. From the right-hand side of the connector, from the tip side, it's exactly the same. Still the same machine crimp contacts. It's still secure for vibration. It still has a solid uh, machine brass housing. But on the left-hand side of this picture, you see the normal PG clamp that you would see 
being standard in the market. Okay, Egbert, what if I need an M12 cable? What kind of options do you guys have for me? Yeah, so we also have a portfolio of pre-assembled M12 cables. This portfolio actually unburdens customers who want to use cables and don't want to make the cables themselves. These cables, they come in lengths from 0.5 to 20 meters length with increments of half a meter. They are using the TE EN4505 compliant cable and also the TE crimped cable jacket products. And we have a couple of configurations. We have a configuration with uh, decoded connectors on both sides. And those are then connected to a CAT5 cable and the connectors are straight. There's a configuration with a CAT5 cable which goes from straight to right angle connector. We have the same for A-coded connectors. So straight to straight, but then with a CAT7 cable. And straight to right angle with a CAT7 cable. And then an X-coded, we have the same again. So X-coded can do 10 gigabit per second from straight to straight and from straight to right angle. All of these cables are with mill connectors on both sides. And if there's a need for other lengths, so odd lengths uh, besides of the 0.5 meter increments or lengths longer than 20 meters, we can make cables upon request. And also female can be included in these uh, special requests then. Okay, cool. Now, you mentioned Ethernet playing a big role in rail systems earlier. What other options do you have for me there? So, yeah, the Ethernet switches, these are basically the core of a train network, right? TE has a full portfolio of Ethernet switches. The portfolio is consisting of the unmanaged switches, managed switches, and a small portfolio of power over Ethernet accessories. And all these switches and accessories are equipped with M12 connectivity, so they can function in uh, the toughest environments from a vibration point of view. They are protected against reverse polarity and overload current, and uh, they all have redundant power inputs. They're equipped with secure data transmission functions. Most of these products, uh, for instance, have a bypass function. And there's also uh, device binding functions, which uh, allows the operators to set up certain devices that are only allowed to communicate with the system. And ACL, access control lists, which also is a safety or security function. And last but not least, there is uh, relay outputs in many of these products, which allows for a function or a line to be run to the train computer so that the driver gets notified when something's wrong with the system. All these switches are IP40 rated. Okay, cool. Now, Egbert, can you explain to me a little bit more about the difference between managed and unmanaged switches? Why would I want a managed switch in this case? Yeah, so I already showed you the typical architecture of a train network. If you remember that slide, you saw bigger switches in the stem of the network, in the base of the network, basically. There were smaller symbols of a switch in the branches of the network. And that's also typically where you use those switches. The managed switches, they can be programmed. I can define for the managed switches, for instance, that the train security or the train operating system gets a certain amount of bandwidth or a certain amount of priority over the passenger Wi-Fi. So we want train control to have always priority over passenger Wi-Fi. I can define who has access to certain areas of the switch in these managed devices. The unmanaged devices, in contradiction, are dumb devices in the sense that they do just what they are defined for. They deliver the packages to the right receiver. Our managed switches and also the unmanaged switches have data speeds ranging from 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit per second. So you can see that they are very well prepared for the future. Most of the products, they support 802.3 AT and AZ, which is a standard for energy efficient power over Ethernet. And they also support a power schedule, so the operator can switch off the cameras, etc. at night when the train doesn't run. They support redundancy functions. Things like a bypass function, which is a function which actually bypasses a switch 
if it's not operating, if it doesn't get power, or if something is wrong with that device. They support dual power input and other things like MSTP, ring protocols, and MRP. And there is a lot of security functions built in these switches, like DDoS, attack prevention, and access control lists. The switches are capable of being managed through remote access, and they support also advanced operation. For those of you who are aware of Jumbo frames, these are supported. The P2P precision time protocol is supported as well. IPv6, uh, there's a mail client in the managed switches. I think that makes sense. Now, Egbert, you also mentioned earlier antennas. So what does TE offer in this space? We have a large range of uh, antennas. I have divided those antennas in three groups. And when I start speaking about these three groups, then we will gradually move from a very real specific product to less and less uh, real specific products. And in the end, in the semi-stationary products, I'm actually speaking about products which are applicable to basically all markets. So the first one uh, is the onboard antennas. And these are the antennas which you can find on the rooftop of a train, which communicate with the train network. But also in this group, you will find the Wi-Fi antennas which spread the Wi-Fi signal through the train for the passengers. In the group of vehicles antennas, we have a, a range of antennas which can be mounted on less rough rail applications or less rough public transportation. So think about buses, uh, tram and metro. And also there is um, a series of antennas which is applicable to emergency response vehicles, which are typically also run by the operators of train networks. You find antennas everywhere in the station, but also outside of the train station. Think about the ticket vending, candy vending, drink vending on the station, but also in the streets. Think about uh, access control, which you can also find anywhere. Think about metering, which is also in stations and also anywhere else in all kinds of buildings. So this last group of products is basically a group of IoT Internet of Things and M2M, machine-to-machine -machine antennas, which can actually be applied in any application. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what does this look like all together, Egbert? Yeah, so if we add the M12 connectivity to the TE-produced rail-compliant cable, we get the M12 cable assemblies, and I already, I already showed them to you. If we add those cables to the switches and the antennas, TE is now uh, in the position to provide the components of the physical onboard network. Okay, so you have the products to provide that onboard network, Egbert, but what about the services that go along with it? We have an application knowledge which goes way back. Application knowledge about cable systems used in trains, but also about the connectors used in trains the vibrations and the shocks we can uh, expect there. We have test labs uh, specifically equipped with uh, devices for this industry. We have uh, lots, loads of experience with designing cables, designing these connectors and designing systems as well for our customers. And uh, we have controlled production. And if I bring that together with the products that we have right now for real data connectivity, we are now in the position to provide physical onboard train network to our customers, including the services that go with that. So train operators can come to us. They can talk about their network needs. We can help them defining the network. We can help them defining the physical cable lengths, uh, making the drawings for that, doing the first installations together with them doing adjustments to the cable lengths, etc., determining where the power supply should be, running cables from the power supplies to the switches, and all that goes along with that. That's a unique position right now, which is not resembled by our competitors at this moment. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. Are there any other products for rugged applications that TE plays in? I know you guys are in other markets as well, right? 
we have a very nice portfolio of DSUP connectors, which is adjacent to the M12 connectivity that I already showed you, because it also uses the crimp jacket system, which we saw with M12. Okay, so what's all included in this portfolio? Well, in there, we basically have a structure which is allowing our customers to build their own DSAP cable. This structure, or these products, uh, consists of hoods, strain reliefs, for which we have a set, the strain relief, which is crimped to the cable jacket. But as with the M12 connector, with the PG system, we also have a compressed strain relief. So customer can make their own choice if they want crimping or the compressing. And we have the connectors and the contacts in the same portfolio. And if we add that all together, we are in the position to provide all the components to build a very nice and very ruggedized DSAP connector with which the customer can build their own cables or we can do it for them if they want. Very cool. So let's dive into some details about these D-sub connectors. The D-sub connectors as said are a very ruggedized connector. They are made of uh, cast zinc, so they are fully metal. They are having a very large packing volume, which allows for dense packing. We can equip these products with uh, either M3 or UNC440 screws. They come with the option to have cable exits in 45 degree or a straight version. And then as said, the customer can choose their own strain relief, either a cable jacket crimping strain relief or a compressed strain relief with uh, screws. Okay, cool. So quick lock sounds pretty nice, Egbert. It seems like you could save a lot of time here. Can you tell me a little bit more about this solution? Yeah, so adjacent to the temp screw portfolio, we have a portfolio of quick lock hoods. And these products are pretty much the same as the temp screw versions. Also with the large pack volume, the option to have angled uh, cable outlet, and of course the uh, high quality full metal shell. But they come with a squeeze to release mechanism. And the way this mechanism works is if you uh, squeeze it in the direction of the blue arrows in this slide, it actually releases from its counterpart. It locks by itself with an audible click when you insert it into the counterpart. And in order to release it, you have to squeeze the two uh, latches. The only thing that has to be done to the counterpart to make this work is to retrofit the counterpart with our quick lock pins, which are available from us as well in uh, several versions to accommodate for the connector and the panel thickness that is used in the counterpart. It's a very, very nice product, which is also having a lot of strength. The two latches, they can withstand 440 newtons, so uh, nearly 44 kilograms. And it saves a lot of uh, assembly time and installation time as well when these connectors are used. Okay, well, this has been a bit to take in today. Now, Egbert, if I wanted more information, where should I go? Well, we have our um, real landing page, as we call it. That site can be found at www.te.com slash USA dash EN slash industry slash rail dot HTML. You can also follow the link in the presentation. In this page, you can find the real data connectivity products amongst others and you can find a load of further information like drawings 3d models you can even order samples of uh, most of our products there and then of course there's still me excellent well i think that's all i have time for today thank you so much for joining me egbert it was a pleasure speaking with you it was a pleasure thank you very much and before we go you didn't forget to click that link did you there you can find even more information about TE Connectivity's Braille Data Connectivity Portfolio. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>